Hello all, Rick here with my review and thoughts on episode 3 of Star Trek Picard's third season, 17 seconds. It's an episode that builds tension and adds stakes for our cast through emotional moments and real threat. The Shrike seems to have the quantum tunnelling device within its armoury and uses it to great effect simply to teleport vessels around, bringing the Titan back into range whenever they try to flee. Such a weapon would be ineffectual against more manoeuvrable shuttlecraft, but the Titan, despite being smaller and a fast vessel at impulse, is still a Starfleet cruiser and slow to turn. It was something noted by Riker too that the Titan VIII really has the mission profile of an exploratory craft and does not have the firepower to stand up to the Shrike, although its shielding seems to be doing a very commendable job in warding off photon torpedoes. It's metaphasic. Picard assesses the situation and concludes that the only course of action is to attack, odds be damned, and while I agree that evading the Shrike seems to be futile, I find it odd that his plan seems to be little more than hit it and hope. In fact, the only pro to Picard's plan I can see is that Vadic does not want them dead, but I see she is still willing to peck away at them, as she describes it, so I'm not against Riker, who commands that the Titan continue to evade for as long as it can. And in fact, his plan would have worked if it was not for the saboteur breaking down the warp engines and removing that option. By this stage, if flight really is no longer an option, then fighting is, but I don't disagree with his choices either. Now, you could argue that Picard saw this outcome coming from the experience, but at this time, he was unaware of the insider on board leaving a trail for Vadic so I feel he did jump to pushing for the offensive far too soon, when escape was still very much on the table. It was certainly added weight to the conversation between Riker and Picard when the latter brought up the fear of fatherhood as a limiting factor. And uh, that was certainly a deep jab at Riker. The episode opened with a look to the past, soon after the birth of Thaddeus Troy Riker, and touched on how fatherhood shaped Riker's outlook. We also get Deanna's first appearance in this season, and it put a smile on my face to see this glimpse into Riker's early times as a family. The sentiment is touching, and we see that beneath all the genuine love Picard has for his friend, there is a sadness at never experiencing the same thing, a lament for what he never had. Of course, this is around the same time Jack Crusher came into being, which leads me to another scene, the confrontation between Beverly and Jean-Luc. This is another emotionally charged scene, and unlike the confrontation between Riker and Picard, I find myself more fully understanding both approaches. From earlier, we know that Picard quietly mourns the fact he has never had the family life that Riker has found, always putting duty first, no matter how dangerous. So, when he learns that he did not even have the choice in the matter, Beverly decided for him, it cuts deep. Who knows if he would have continued on as an admiral, if asked, and he sums it up succinctly by, well, saying as much. In turn, Beverly admits her own fears fueling her actions. She has lost everyone around her, her parents when she was young, her husband under Picard's command, and then Wesley, and while not dead, is part of the Travellers now and away protecting other times and timelines. She could not stay with Picard. There was too much danger involved in his new role as the face of the Romulan evacuations, and she wanted to keep Jack's identity a secret in case he was used against him. Understandable motives for a mother, Above all, she wanted to keep her family safe in a universe that has already taken that from her several times. This whole scene was engaging, and I think believable. On the Raffi and Worf front, this is the first episode where we get to see him in action fully, and there is still that comedic edge to him that works better considering his introduction displayed his more badass side already. Worf does not technically work for Starfleet Intelligence, or perhaps he does and it's more of a deniable asset. Either way, he is a good choice for this, and while he was never exactly subtle in TNG, DS9 tenure did a lot to develop him. He has continued to trend, it seems, becoming a very focused and calm individual, one who makes an apt agent. He already had his paranoia and instincts, as well as the security background and political knowledge to work this, and while not a future I had foreseen for him, 
and this one I think fits, honestly far better than the role of a starship captain. Rafi, as expected, is having doubts as to how much she has sacrificed and on the verge of throwing it all in, if Worf had not reached out to her to assure that they would continue the hunt themselves, while interrogating Titus Erika. I remember thinking that perhaps they had underestimated how devoted or resilient this lowlife was, but I was not prepared for how much. So we get the mention of Odo feeding Starfleet intelligence, or at least his old friend Worf, information that there are changelings who have separated from the Great Link in order to pursue some anti-Federation objective. Why remains to be seen, as well as how come it seems to be Picard as a target. I can speculate and look into other stories that featured such relics of the Dominion to look for motivations, but honestly, I feel that this is going to be something new, or at least something from Picard that we've seen before, rather than folding in outside apocryphal content. What I'm saying is, I think there are still other players on the field. It was heartwarming to see that Worf fondly remembers his time from DS9, and that Odo seems to be trying to maintain the peace between the Dominion and the Federation by trusting Starfleet to handle this covertly. Understandably, the involvement of Changelings answers a lot of questions as to how the Daystrom Institute was burgled and the Recruitment Bureau hit. These Changelings seem to have infiltrated several layers of society, from the USS Titan to the criminal underworld, and such placements are all working towards some goal. It's a good antagonist to be behind the scenes, one that the Federation has had recent history with, and a perfectly capable threat when it comes to bringing low the UFP, so yeah, the scale increases. The show is moving very slowly right now. I expected us to be on our way home to the ESD or some other rendezvous by this point, and I'm not complaining because I'm enjoying things so far. In fact, I take it as a sign that the show is not going to be jumping around for the sake of it. While Jack is passing out on the floor, he sees visions of Seven of Nine saying Jack and connecting the branches and other indistinct phrases, as well as seeing a vision of a storm and a red door. I take this to mean he is putting together the strands of this conspiracy in his head, and might be able to supply some answers when he wakes. Either that or the strange emissions from the nebula they are in have some other effect going on, because evidently this is going to come up again. They've dropped the strange nebula biosigns before, and we are reminded twice in this episode so it has to come to something. Also, it was a fun aside hearing Picard ask about the accent Jack had, with Beverly explaining and even making jokes about it being hereditary once he picked it up from London. Especially as it was something called out by watchers of the show, and it actually got answered. Again, this is a minor detail getting a couple of seconds to alleviate a gripe, something that I feel this show would have previously ignored. Attention to detail is appreciated. In terms of the look of the show, once more the visuals of combat in space are clear to follow and full of tense moments. It's also fun to see Vadik at work, a very collected individual with a clear plan of action up her sleeve. The flashback scene featured some slight de-aging, maybe it was the quality of my stream, but I did not notice anything out of place or uncanny about it. I almost liked the slightly modified it movie era uniform Riker was wearing, making this one that followed on from that era just after his appearance in Lower Decks, and I say I almost liked it because it's yet another variation added on for no reason that I can see, but at least I can tell where it lands in the chronology from its look. So overall this was an intense episode, upgrading the stakes for our TNG crew and the Federation itself. The butting heads of Picard with Crusher and Riker is showing the strain in friendship which I have no doubt will endure, even if they clash. While Vadik keeps the Titan A cornered and continues harassing them as she promised into submission. The involvement of the Changelings increases the stakes as rogue or not, the echoes of the Dominion are still going to be something that gives Starfleet shivers, and as anyone who has seen DS9 can attest, they are not to be taken lightly. A solid episode of development with discussions I wanted to see from all involved, that suitably raises the crisis level, and I look forward to the next part. Thanks for watching this video, I've been Rick, and I'll see you again later for another one. Thanks again, and goodbye.